All right, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's Dr. Kaz here, and I am bringing you a review session, supplemental video for the second half of Chapter 13. Um, and we will pick up where we left off in our discussion about the different regions of the brain. And so we're going to start off with the second, or excuse me, the third region of the brain, and that's the brain stem. Okay. We've talked about the cerebrum so far and the diencephalon. All right. But now we're going to talk about a very crucial and integral part, region of our brain, and that is the brainstem. And it's important because it's a connection point. And essentially what it does is it connects the spinal cord to the other three regions of the brain, the cerebrum, the diencephalon, and the cerebellum. All right. So in this area, we're going to find many critical components. And some of them are listed here. We're going to find our ascending and descending tracts. So in case you're not clear or you forgot what a tract is, in the central nervous system, in the CNS, all right, a tract is a bundle of parallel axons, all right? So just to kind of give you a comparison to that, in the peripheral nervous system, all right, a bundle of parallel axons, we call that a nerve. But in the central nervous system, we call those tracks. So ascending tracks are going to be sensory tracks or pathways that go from the periphery of your body up towards the brain. Okay. Descending tracks are going to originate in the brain. All right. Or in, well, yeah, the, in the brain, and it's going to descend out to the periphery, and those are going to be comprised of motor output information. Okay, so I want you to know the difference, and we'll go over that in other chapters. All right, we'll review that concept there. Okay, so in the brain stem, we're going to find these structures here autonomic nuclei. Okay, now here's another definition. All right, a nuclei is going to be, all right, again, in the central nervous system, a nuclei is going to be a cluster of cell bodies, okay, a cluster of cell bodies. So to compare that, all right, when we're talking about the peripheral nervous system, all right, a cluster of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system, we call that a ganglia. All right, a ganglia. Okay, so in the brainstem, we'll have our autonomic nuclei, all right, the nuclei of our cranial nerves, all right, and all the cranial nerve is is just a nerve that comes off the brain, all right. So if the nerve is if a nerve is coming off of the spinal cord, we call that a spinal nerve. If it's coming off of the brain, we call that a cranial nerve. And finally, we'll also find reflex centers. And we'll get into that. And actually, you'll talk about the different reflex centers uh, throughout uh, biology to 11, okay? Because especially when you get to uh, the digestive system, even the cardiovascular system, you're gonna find several reflex centers located in your brainstem that help to govern certain vital functions, okay? So, the brainstem is broken down into three regions, the midbrain, which is the most superior, the pons, which is right in the middle of the brainstem, and then the medulla oblongata. That's the most inferior portion of your brainstem, and then that portion becomes contiguous right, with the spinal cord. Okay, So we're going to break each of those uh, areas down. Let me just show you a quick picture here of the brainstem. Okay, You can see we've color, colorized the different parts of the brain stem. So in this kind of greenish region, that's our midbrain. All right, right below that, you're going to see the pons. And then down here in the inferior portion, this is the medulla oblongata. And what sits right on top of the midbrain is the thalamus, all right, or the thalami when I'm talking about both. It's like an ice cream cone. So the brain stem's the cone, and the thalami are going to be the ice cream. And that's what we're seeing here. This is an anterior view. So looking at the front, all right, you can see we have several nerves coming off, and those are our cranial nerves, all right? There are 12 pairs of those, all right? So cranial nerves 1 through 12 are going to be coming off the brainstem, and we'll talk about that, all right? Okay. Let's get into here. This is the posterior lateral, so now you kind of see it from the back side portion, kind of at an angle here. All right, we can see several different 
all right, uh, variations and, and structures, all right, that we'll all get into. We'll discuss this here in the upcoming moments here. So let's start off with the superior most part of the brain stem, and that's our midbrain, okay? And you, I'm gonna go back and forth and kind of point out these structures here, all right? Now there's several structures that we're not gonna cover, all right? It's just, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, structures in the brain stem, but we're gonna cover quite a few of them. All right, the first are gonna be the cerebral peduncles. And this is an important structure, all right, because it carries the motor tracts. And primarily, this is going to carry the motor tracts of the voluntary muscle system, which is going to be the skeletal muscle system. So therefore, all right, these are going to be descending tracts, all right, and they're going to originate in the primary motor cortex, which is the pre, all right, central gyrus there, okay? That's that one gyrus, all right, that's in the posterior portion of the frontal lobe. Right, it sits right in front of the central sulcus there. Okay, so it's going to carry voluntary motor commands, which means basically the end organ, the effector organ, is going to be the skeletal muscles. All right, so the cerebral peduncles are pretty much going to be motor tracts. We call them the pyramidal system here. All right, and we can see that on the front and side of the midbrain here. All right, then we also have the superior cerebellar peduncles. All right, now you have to understand something about the, the, the uh, brainstem, okay? Posterior to the brainstem is the cerebellum, okay? So each part of the brainstem has its own connection to the cerebellum, okay? And so those connections, we call those cerebellar peduncles, okay? So since the midbrain is the most superior portion, all right, it's connection system, we call that the superior cerebellar peduncles, right? And that's going to carry, all right, neurons that are gonna connect the midbrain, all right, to the cerebellum. Now, when you get into chapter 15, all right, actually, no, I take that back. Chapter 14, we're gonna talk more about the medial lemniscus, all right? So I'll just briefly mention it here, all right? But the medial lemniscus is gonna carry myelinated axons, so that means all right, the medial lemniscus will have a little bit of a whitish coloring to it, all right? But most importantly, it carries ascending axons, which means, all right, those axons there are sensory axons, all right? So all the axons, all right, in the medial lemniscus are going to carry sensory information, all right? And it's going to ascend up through the brainstem here, all right? Now, one of the areas that we're really going to, you're going to hear a lot of discussion probably in your careers is going to be, all right, especially if you're dealing with Parkinson's disease, all right, you'll hear about the substantia niagara. Now, the substantia niagara, all right, is this grouping of cells that has a darker color, all right, uh, involved because of the presence of melanin, okay? But it's important because these cells produce a very important neurotransmitter, which is dopamine. All right? Now, dopamine has several functions physiologically in the body. But here, all right, in the substantia niagara, the dopamine here all right, is going to be a neurotransmitter that is going to help regulate particular movements and responses all right, for pleasure and pain. Okay? So dopamine will act as an inhibitory neurotransmitter to help kind of uh, deal with more uh, particular and fine, precise motor movements here, all right? So we'll see that these cells, all right, in the substantia niagara are going to produce dopamine. Now, problem is, all right, if you have Parkinson's disease, all right, we've seen, all right, degeneration of these cells. So as these cells degenerate, the amount of neurotransmitter of dopamine degenerates and decreases, so therefore, you'll see some of the symptomology of Parkinson's, all right, what we call resting tremors. Someone could be just standing there, you could have a conversation with them, and their hands will be shaky, all right? And those are what we refer to as resting tremors, all right? And as it progresses, the symptoms become much more uh, 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 severe, all right? But that is due to the degeneration of those cells in the midbrain, in the substantia niagara. All right, so let me just pop up here and show you a couple of those areas. Actually, that's not pop up. Um, 
Well, let's say, well, here we go. Let me show you at least here, all right? Here's going to be our cerebral peduncles here. That's gonna be our motor tracks there, okay? Now you can't see that's on the inside, all right? But here in the midbrain region, we would be able to see the substantia niagara. Now on the posterior portion here, all right? You should be able to see here, this is, again, the posterior portion, so the, the cerebellum, is going to sit here right on the back here of the, of the brain stem and here is our superior cerebellar peduncle that's going to connect to the cerebellum all right and provide a, a connection between those two regions of the brain there all right so this other structure called the tegmentum all right again all right we're going to be dealing with motor control specifically for our postural motor control all right, that's gonna be the tegmentum and you'll see the tegmentum, all right. Let's see if I can find a better view here for the tegmentum. No, I don't have, I didn't include it on this slideshow and I apologize. Um, you can see it usually better through a, a, a cross section here. All right, but keep in mind the tegmentum is going to contain, and we'll talk about the reticular formation in a little bit, all right? That also has to do with postural regulation, postural motor control, all right? Then the cerebral aqueduct. Now, we haven't talked about this yet, but the cerebral aqueduct is a component of our ventricular system. The ventricular system, all right, is going to be um, the uh, system that incorporates the cerebral spinal fluid. All right, so you have these chambers inside of your brain, all right? There's four of them, okay? You have the left and right lateral ventricles, then the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle. And those are just chambers that are gonna house cerebral spinal fluid, okay? They'll produce it, circulate it throughout. All right, we'll talk about some of the functions of cerebral spinal fluid, all right? But the cerebral aqueduct is going to connect, all right, the distal portion all right, of this ventricular system, the third and fourth ventricles to one another, okay? And so surrounding the cerebral aqueduct, right, you'll see this grayish material, which we call the periaqueductal gray, all right? And that sits around the cerebral aqueduct. But importantly, the cerebral aqueduct is this long tube-like structure that's going to allow circulation of the cerebral spinal fluid. All right, so in the midbrain, we are going to find cranial nerves three and cranial nerve four, all right, oculomotor and trochlear nerves, all right? And so when we say it houses the nuclei, basically what that is is that's the beginning of these neurons, all right? The nuclei, all right, are going to be, all right, the cluster of cell bodies, and these cluster of cell bodies are gonna give rise, their axons are gonna give rise, all right, to these cranial nerves. Right, so we'll see their cell bodies are going to be located here in the midbrain. All right, then we have our tectum. All right, and on the back portion here, we call it the tectoplate. Let me show you that one. I definitely know we have. All right, you probably when you get to the um, chapter 13 uh, lab uh, slides, you'll see the tectoplate. We call it something dip different. All right, we call it the corpora quadrumina. But basically, you have these four bumps that sit on the back of the midbrain here, two on top, two on bottom. The top two are superior colliculi, the bottom two are, are inferior colliculi. So when you're looking at that area, all right, directly posteriorly, it'll look kind of like this. It'll almost look like a square, and then you'll see the four mounds here or bumps. All right, so that whole square, we refer to that as the tectal plate, okay? So on the top two, those are gonna be your superior colliculi up here, all right? And then your bottom two, that's the inferior colliculi. And they have to do with reflexive movements, all right? The top two have to do with the visual system, all right? If you're watching a tennis match or a volleyball match and they volley the ball back and forth from end to end, all right, on the court there, um, as your eyes are following it, you're utilizing the superior colliculi. The inferior colliculi has to do with your auditory system, your hearing. For example, if you're sitting somewhere in class and someone behind you uh, is saying your name, all right, this allows you, the inferior colliculi help you to localize where that sound is coming from, and then you can turn your head in that direction to see what they want, all right? That's what the inferior colliculi will help you with, OK? 
okay? And that is all located here in the tectal plate, okay? So superior colliculi, visual reflexes and tracking, inferior colliculi, auditory reflexes, all right? That's all found in the tectum. All right, the pons is the second region of our brainstem here. It's between the superior and inferior portions, between the medulla oblongata and the midbrain here, all right? And so primarily what we're going to see in the pons is going to be both sensory and motor tracks, just coming and going, up, up and down, all right, the brainstem, going down to the spinal cord, heading up to the brain, okay? So, of course, in this area, we're going to have our connection to the cerebellum, so we're going to call that the middle cerebellar peduncles because literally the, the pons sits right in front of the cerebellum. So its axons run in a transverse or almost a horizontal orientation because it goes directly uh, posterior back from the pons, okay? So we have an important structure here called the pontine respiratory center, all right? And it helps to regulate the skeletal muscles of breathing. Now, primarily, the, the diaphragm is the, is the primary muscle uh, that's involved in respiration, all right, when you're breathing. But in some situations, if you want to take a deep breath in, you're going to recruit some other muscles. Or if you want to have a forceful exhale, you're going to recruit some other muscles. All right. But point is, the skeletal muscles are going to help with the breathing pattern. Now, you don't notice this, but as you're sitting here watching this video or just reading a book or even watching TV, your breathing pattern should be relatively smooth. It should just be nice and, and, and easy going. All right. If you were to lesion the pontine respiratory center, all right, the transition from inspiration to expiration and from expiration to inspiration, it would not be a smooth transition. It would almost be kind of ratcheted, all right? So it'd be <laughs> kind of like a kind of a, 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 a ratcheting up and a ratcheting down, all right? So the pontine respiratory center helps with that. Now, if you were to lesion the, ponti the pontine respiratory center, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't be able to breathe. You would just lack that smooth transition there, okay? All right, then we've got our superior olivary nuclei. Again, that's going to help deal with that sound localization. All right, we'll talk more about that when you get into the special senses. And then we have a couple cranial nerves that are going to be coming off of the pons. All right, so of course, we'll see their, the nuclei there, essentially the origin of these neurons, or, or these nerves, excuse me. Both sensory and motor neurons will be present there because we're going to see cranial nerve nuclei for cranial nerve five, which is the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve six, all right, which is the abducens nerve, cranial nerve seven, which is the facial nerve, and cranial nerve eight, which is the vestibular cochlear nerve, all right? So those, some of those uh, uh, cranial nerves are what we call mixed, or, or, or yeah, mixed neurons, or nerves, excuse me, which that means they have both motor and sensory neurons and both motor and sensory function, all right? So we'll see that throughout. Like, for example, vestibular cochlear is a sensory uh, nerve, which it primarily just houses sensory neurons, all right, for hearing and equilibrium, which helps with your balance so you're not tipping over. Okay, so the final part of the brainstem, one of my favorite portions, is the medulla oblongata, okay? Now, the medulla oblongata is going to connect the spinal cord to your brain, okay? So similar to the pons, it's going to have both sensory and motor tracks, all right, that are going to connect the spinal cord, the periphery of your body, up to your brain. All right, so we're going to see on the front portion of the medulla oblongata these structures that are called pyramids. So they're paired, which means you have a pyramid on the right side and a pyramid on the left side. It's important that you understand that, but it contains what we call the corticospinal tracts. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about that in Chapter 14, all right, but corticospinal tracts are going to be these motor tracks, all right, that originate, again, up in the primary motor cortex, and they're going to descend down to the spinal cord here, all right? Now, these cortical spinal tracks are for more muscle motor control, all right? But now, remember what we said, all right, these motor tracks cross over, all right? I'm not going to say all, but most of the motor neurons will cross over. And there's two places that they can cross over. One is going to be in the brainstem, specifically here in the medulla oblongata at the pyramids. This is what we're going to call the decusation of the pyramids. All right? Decusation means that they cross over. 
all right? The other location will be in the spinal cord. So some of these motor neurons, well, actually most of these motor neurons will cross over at the decusation of the pyramids. And then some will cross over, all right, in the spinal cord. And we'll talk more about that uh, in chapter 14. But basically what we're going to see is, all right, one side of the cerebral cortex is going to control the opposite side of the body. Okay. Now, if we just go lateral to the pyramids, all right, we have uh, another bulge on each side, and those are called the olives. All right. Now, the olives are going to contain our inferior olivary nucleus. Again, a nucleus is going to be a cluster of cell bodies. All right. But what it does is, is that these olives are going to relay proprioceptive information to the cerebellum. Now, we're going to, in a moment here, we're going to talk about the importance of the cerebellum. All right. But when we talk about proprioceptive information, proprioceptive information is your body's awareness of where it is in space. OK, so what does that mean? Well, first of all, we're going to have proprioceptors, all right, which are going to be these sensory receptors, and they're going to be located in the joints. So around your muscles and the tendons and joint capsules, we'll find these proprioceptors. And basically, that's going to provide information to your brain as to what that joint is doing. For example, all right, if your eyes are closed and someone and you're lying in bed, all right, and someone is going to bend your knee, your eyes are closed, all right, so someone bends your knee, then those proprioceptors are going to fire off information and send it to your brain, and it's going to say, hey, your knee is now in the flexed position. Now, if that same person goes to straighten your leg, and again, you can't see any of this, so those proprioceptors are firing off information, sending it up to your brain saying, hey, your leg is now straight. You've extended your knee. Okay, So that's what we're talking about all right, when we're dealing with proprioceptive information. So this proprioceptive information is going to go to the cerebellum. All right? The cerebellum plays a huge role in fine motor movement. All right, regulatory movement in regards to coordinated activities. All right, we'll talk about that in a moment, but it's really important. Like, for example, if you've ever played an instrument, for example, let's say the piano, maybe even the guitar, whatever, violin, all right, there's going to be some coordination that's involved with that. Well, obviously, you're not going to be very good in the beginning, okay, unless you're some sort of savant or genius. OK, so over time, as you practice and, you know, the same perfect practice makes perfect. And what you're doing is, is you're involving several different regions of the brain all right, and helping with these coordinated movements. But a lot of that information is going to go to the cerebellum and it's going to provide that biofeedback to correct those movements there. We'll talk more about that in a second. And then finally, OK, we're going to have our inferior cere bleh, cere cerebellar all right, peduncles. And this is the connecting point for the medulla oblongata to the cerebrum, okay? So remember, each region or, or part of the brainstem has a connection to the cerebellum. So now when we get into the medulla oblongata, this is an important uh, uh, um, aspect of the medulla oblongata, the fact that it houses autonomic nuclei of the medulla. See, an autonomic nuclei is basically, all right, a part of your autonomic nervous system. We really haven't talked too much about that, okay? But I want you to think of the autonomic nervous system right now, right, as the part of your nervous system that's going to govern govern all of your vital life functions. It's going to help regulate homeostasis, right? Fight or flight, rest and digest, all of that stuff. Pretty much everything that kind of uh, um, goes on behind the scenes. You're not going to be aware of a lot of the processes because they're under the consciousness level, right? Like your heart rate, your respiratory rate, your digestive processes, right? So all of that is going to fall under the autonomic nervous system, okay? You're going to get into much more detail in Chapter 15 and kind of break that information down, okay? So not to worry if you don't understand it now. You will when you go over Chapter 15, all right? But several of our autonomic nuclei reside here in the medulla oblongata. For example, the cardiac center, all right? That's going to regulate your heart's output. Now, what does that mean? How much blood your heart is, your heart is pumping out, all right? You're going to learn this equation later on, all right, in um, bio 211, all right? But cardiac output is equal to the heart rate, 
okay? Obviously, we can figure that out, how many times your heart beats in a minute, all right? Your heart rate times what we call stroke volume. So what's stroke volume? Stroke volume is the amount of blood, all right, that your heart pushes out with every beat, okay? So the cardiac center is going to, one, affect the heart rate, either make your heart beat faster or slower, because that's going to affect the cardiac output, but also it's going to affect how much blood it can pump out with each beat. So it can increase, all right, by, by increasing the stroke volume, usually it's going to increase the strength of the contraction. It'll pump harder, all right, on that beat to push more blood out. All right, you get to go over all that fun stuff um, in Bio 211. All right, so the cardiac center regulates that. Speed the heart up, slow it down, make it pump harder or not, okay? The vasomotor center is important when we're discussing how big or how small the diameter, which is the lumen, that's the space inside the blood vessel, the tube size, all right? How big or how small the blood vessel, blood vessel di diameter is going to be. This plays a big role, big role in regulation of blood pressure. Okay, so basically, if we constrict the blood vessel, we call that vasoconstriction, we're going to increase the blood pressure. You're going to learn about that because you're going to increase the resistance. All right, so if we want to decrease our blood pressure, then we're going to undergo vasodilation. We're going to make the diameter of the tube bigger so there's less resistance. So that will decrease the blood pressure. All right, we also have our respiratory center here. This is the uh, control center for your breathing rate. All right, the respiratory breathing rate is usually 12 to 16 breaths per minute, 12 to 15, all right, I believe the book says. I've seen it in different literature to be 12 to 16. Regardless, all right, it's going to control that breathing rate, okay? And so if it increases or decreases, that's going to occur here in the medullary respiratory center. You have two groups there, dorsal and ventral respiratory groups, all right? And so both of those groups are going to play a role in the breathing rate. But at the same time, this respiratory center is going to uh, communicate with another respiratory center, which we saw before, the pontine respiratory center. So we can have that nice smooth transition between inspiration and expiration. It's important. And then you can see, look at the number of other functions all right, that also occur here, all right, in the medulla oblongata, coughing, sneezing, vomiting, salivating, swallowing, all right, a lot of your digestive processes not even listed here on this slide, all right? So in my opinion, the medulla oblongata is one of the most important parts of the brain, okay? If not the most important part of the brain stem, all right, I'm not taking anything away from the midbrain or the pons, all right, but there's a lot going on in the medulla oblongata, okay? And then, of course, let's not forget our cranial nerves, all right? We're going to have our, nucle our nerve nuclei here, the origins of these nerves, all right? And so we're going to see, all right, the nuclei, all right, for cranial nerves 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. So vestibular cochlear, all right, is going to be 8. Glossal pharyngeal is cranial nerve 9, vagus. Big hitter, cranial nerve 10, accessory, cranial nerve 11, hypoglossal, cranial nerve 12, okay? Um, in chapter 14, we'll talk more about the nucleus cuneatus and the nucleus gracilis, but understand that these two structures are going to play a role in somatic sensory information. Somatic sensory information is information that you are consciously aware of, okay? For example, fibra bleh, vibration, all right, is a somatic sensation, all right? Touch and pressure are going to be somatic sensations. So that sensory information is going to travel up to both the nucleus cuneatus and the nucleus gracilis, depending on where that sensation is coming from. If it's coming from your legs, all right, it's going to wind up going up to the nucleus gracilis. If it's coming from your arms, all right, and your upper portion of your trunk, then it's going to head to the nucleus cuneatus here, all right? So that sensory information will travel, all right, to the medial lemniscus, up to the thalamus, and then eventually to your somatosensory cortex, 
where you come to the conscious realization of what that sensory information is. Because remember, the thalamus is that relay point, okay? If sensory information comes up through your body, through the spinal cord, through the brainstem, up to the thalamus, but it never leaves the thalamus to go up to the somatosensory cortex, you won't have conscious perception of that, okay? It's got to make it past the thalamus, all right, and then get into the cerebral cortex there. Otherwise, you have no idea what's going on, okay? So keep that in mind. The thalamus is the relay station. All right, the very last structure of our cerebellum is going to be, all right, uh, well, excuse me, the very last structure of our brain or region is going to be the cerebellum, okay? The little brain, the mini brain. All right, so it sits posterior to the brainstem, and similar to the cerebrum, because the cerebrum has the gyri, has those folds, all right, the cerebellum has its own set of folds, but we call those folia, okay? Similar to the cerebrum, the cerebellum has hemispheres, right and left cerebral hemispheres, okay? And it is separated by this structure called the primary fissure. All right, excuse me, excuse me, not the primary fissure. Sorry, sorry. Those cerebral hemispheres are separated by, all right, the vermis here. Okay, you'll find the vermis right in between. We'll talk about that in a second. But each cerebral hemisphere, all right, has an anterior and posterior lobe. And what separates that is the primary fissure. I got ahead of myself. Okay. So we're going to talk about, and again, I do want to point out too, when we're talking about the cerebellum here, okay, your cerebrum had the, the cerebral cortex. That was that outer gray matter. Same thing here in the cerebellum. It has its own outer gray matter. We call that the cerebellar cortex. But deep to that with all that white matter there, we don't call that, all right, the white matter um, like we did, like the internal capsule, for example, was the white matter in the cerebrum, all right? In the cerebellum, we call it the arbor vita, the tree of life, okay? And then we'll also see pockets of gray matter within the arbor vita, all right? And those are going to be nuclei, so we refer to those as the deep cerebellar nuclei, all right? So just kind of a quick review here, you can see all right, we have three nerve tracts that are going to connect the cerebrum to the brainstem. You remember those. Superior cerebellar peduncles are going to connect to the midbrain. Middle cerebellar peduncles are going to connect to the pons. And the inferior cerebellar peduncles are going to connect to the medulla oblongata. Okay? So keep that in mind. Those are the connections to all those different regions of, all right, the uh, brainstem. So what does this, the, the cerebellum do? That's a great question. It's a fine tuner. That's what it does. It's going to coordinate and it's going to fine tune movements. Okay. So basically it's all about corrective patterns. So this structure, all right, is wonderful in that it helps to store muscle memory. Okay. So when you're learning to do a skill that requires maybe sewing, all right, if you're a surgeon, and you're practicing through, you know, uh, uh, doing sutures, for example, right? You're going to obviously be better after a couple years, I hope sooner than that, but you know what I mean, all right? Uh, at performing sutures than the very first time that you did it. And that's because you store, all right, not, not every bit, but some or, or a lot of our motor muscle memory here in the cerebellum, okay? And so we're going to see how it's going to regulate both voluntary and involuntary motor pathways, okay? So that means it's going to regulate skeletal muscle and smooth muscle for sure, right? It's going to help regulate that, right? And so it is also going to make adjustments, all right, to the movements that originate up in our cerebellar motor cortex, not cerebellar, excuse me, cerebral motor cortex, all right? And then the outcome will be nice, smooth movements here, okay? So again, think of it as like this 
area of the brain that is going to make sure that movement patterns are nice and smooth all right, and coordinated. Okay, it plays a huge role in equilibrium and posture, right? When we're talking about that term balance, all right, if you're trying to walk a straight line, for example, all right, or balance yourself on a curb, all right, or a parking pylon when you're trying to walk heel toe, heel toe, this helps with that. It provides tons, all right, of proprioceptive information from your muscles and joints, and it will give feedback on that. So it's going to be inundated with that proprioceptive information, that information of where certain body parts are, what joints are doing, what the muscles are doing, and it's going to get that information, all right? And then it's going to provide corrective feedback, all right, to those end organs, to those structures here. All right. So essentially, it it, it it does error correcting. So if it notices that you're pronating too much on your ankle or whatnot, or if you're flexing too much at the knee, it will make these error correcting signals and it will send that information to your primary motor cortex or to the uh, uh, premotor cortex. And it'll help to make corrections to that. So you're able to maybe better balance yourself or better to be able to uh, do a jump shot. Okay. Play the violin a little bit better. All right. It's really quite fascinating. So these cerebellar pathways here. All right. Here you're going to see. All right. If we start with the voluntary movements, you're going to say, all right, I'm going to go and um, what's a juggle. Okay, so when you first start to juggle, you're not, you're not catching things right. You're not getting the juggling sacks to the right height. No problem, all right? So that voluntary motor information is going to descend. It's going to go out to your arms, and you're going to start throwing the sacks around trying to juggle them. Meanwhile, it's sending some of that information here, all right, to the cerebellum, okay? So as you start to juggle, and you're not – you're, you're you're trying to figure out, all right, why am I not doing very well with this? All right, what do I need to do? All right, your cerebellum is going to send corrective feedback, all right, up to your motor cortex to, to help to generate more of a smoothness in that juggling. Where at the same time as you're juggling, you're going to be getting information from those proprioceptors, all right, telling your cerebellum, all right, what your elbow is doing, what your wrists are doing, what your glenohumeral joint is doing, what those muscles that help move those joints are doing, right? And so helping you to fine tune that to eventually get more successful at maybe juggling from maybe 10 seconds to 30 seconds to 40 seconds without dropping anything. So it's just this feedback system, this loop here, that's trying to make corrections all right, to improve your ability, all right, with that skill. So that's why, all right, when you have imbibed too much alcohol or taken some drugs that impair your cerebellar function, you will have some symptoms like being unable to balance yourself, disturbance in gait. It's interesting when you when folks talk about roadside sobriety tests. Basically, if someone's pulled over for drunk driving or suspecting of drunk driving, okay, the police officer is just having you perform, all right, cerebellar function tests, all right? They call it Trendelenburg gates when they have you walk heel to toe on the white line on the road, all right? Obviously, if you drank too much, your cerebellum is unable, all right, or has a lot of difficulty in trying to coordinate those motor movements there and the information from proprioception is going to be skewed so you'll have problems walking you'll have issues with trying to maintain balance all right we'll also have issues with your proprioceptive information because those are hindered and they get in the processing of the cerebellum causes issues right so there's a number of 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 cerebellar function tests that these police officers will perform and 
if you've had too much to drink, you will have quite a bit of difficulty um, performing them. All right, so that's it for the regions of the brain. Now I want to talk about certain areas or certain systems inside the brain. The first is the limbic system, what we refer to as the emotional brain, okay? And this limbic system is made up of several different components that we've already talked about, all right? So several cerebral and several structures found in the diencephalon that are going to be involved when we are experiencing emotions and processing emotions, all right? So let's talk about the components first, and then we'll talk a little bit about what the, the limbic system and how it handles it, okay? So you have a couple structures here, all right? The cingulate gyrus, all right? This is going to be found just above that corpus callosum here. It's one gyrus, all right? This helps to connect several different regions uh, 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 or certain um, cerebral structures right, with other structures uh, in the diencephalon and, uh, and in multiple areas here, all right? But if we see here in the temporal lobe, all right, the perihippal, excuse me, perihippocampal gyrus, all right, you're going to see a structure, all right, at the superior portion of the perihippocampal gyrus, all right, which is called the hippocampus. And this structure is crucial in forming our long-term memories. Crucial. If you lesion the hippocampus, all right, you are going to be able to, or unable, to form long-term memories all right, at that point. Meaning, so if I was 50 years old and I suffered a brain injury that damaged my hippocampus, all right, I would have all my memories from 50 back, but from my age of 50 forward, I would be unable to form long-term memories. So if I met somebody new, there's a good chance I wouldn't know who the heck they were the next day if I ran into them again, okay? And that's the damage to the hippocampus, okay? Another structure that is very, very important is the amygdaloid body, the amygdala, right? This structure is involved with emotion and emotional memory, okay? Big time when we're dealing with fear, all right? Because the limbic system is involved in emotions, all right? Pleasure, fear, joy, all right? Um, anytime that you have certain emotions, you're involving the limbic system here, all right? And the amygdaloid body, all right, deals with emotions and also emotional memory. If you were to lesion the amygdala, then folks are that have damage to the amyg to the amygdala will have very odd responses to certain things that invoke emotion. So they can have an exaggerated fearful response of something whereas a, a person that doesn't have a lesion to the amygdala, they would just be like, "Oh, you might be a little bit nervous from that or a little bit of fear, but this person that has the lesion would be inconsolable. They would just be out of control. And for whatever reason, folks that damage their amygdala will have very perverse sexual predilections and activities. Okay. A couple other structures that are involved in the limbic system, olfactory valves, olfactory tracts, and the olfactory cortex, which means, all right, when you're smelling stuff, you can have an emotional response. So olfaction is tied into, all right, your limbic system. And the example that I always like to talk about is, is like when you're driving down the road in the neighborhood and you take a whiff of some food, all right, like a barbecue, and you're like, man, that reminds me of Uncle Ted's barbecue. And then you start to get a little bit nostalgic and emotional, meaning, you know, you might get a little, uh, a little teary-eyed, um, because you remember all the fun times that you had at the barbecues eating the delicious barbecue food, okay? And then finally, we've got the fornix, and the fornix, again, is basically one of our connecting uh, tracks here. So it's going to connect the hippocampus to several other limbic structures, okay? 
And so there's several other structures I won't get into. The anterior thalamic nuclei, habenular nuclei. Well, the habenular nuclei is part of the diencephalon, all right, the epithalamus there. Habenular nuclei is going to play a role in um, visceral responses to certain smells, all right? Then the septonuclei and the mammillary bodies. All those are just some other structures that are part of the limbic system there. All right. So another area in our brain is called the reticular formation. We discussed this when we were uh, going over the brain stem here. And basically, the reticular formation is going to be all right, some gray matter that we will find in the brain stem. And it has a motor aspect to it and a sensory aspect to it. All right, so the motor component is basically going to regulate muscle tone. Okay, muscle tone. So we'll see that at various stages. All right, and when I say muscle tone, how tight or how loose your muscles are. Okay. And so that changes depending on, all right, whether you're awake or asleep. If you're asleep, your muscle tone should be down-regulated. It should be somewhat loose and relaxed. When you're awake, all right, your muscle tone should be a little bit more tense because a lot of times you might be sitting upright, all right, and so therefore you're going to be um, uh, invoking or stimulating these muscles for possibly postural uh, positioning and whatnot, okay? So the motor component will help out with certain autonomic functions. The sensory component, all right, we refer to that as the reticular activating system or the RAS, all right? So this component is going to take sensory information, all right, usually from your surroundings, all right, and it's going to send that sensory information to your cerebral cortex. And it's going to provide a certain level of alertness, okay? So think of alertness, on, it's on a scale, okay? So for example, when you're asleep, you're not very alert, all right? Versus when you're watching this video and listening to it, all right, you're going to be somewhat alert, okay? So we talk about these states of consciousness, all right? So the reticular activating system all right, is highly active when you're wide awake, okay? So when you have higher levels of consciousness going on or states of consciousness, all right? But it's not very active, all right, when you have lower states of consciousness, for example, sleeping, okay? All right, so here you can see our reticular formation as it's running through the brainstem here. All right, and again, it's going to receive sensory information from different senses, all right, special senses like visual, auditory, touch, tactile senses too, all right, that's going to send that information, all right, up to specific regions of your cerebrum there, depending on what that sensory information is. If it's, for example, auditory, information, it's going to send that information to the temporal lobe, okay? If it's visual, all right, then it's going to send that information over here to the occipital lobe. And then, of course, going the other way, or right, we're talking about the motor output, that information will originate here in the primary motor cortex, and it'll descend along, all right, the motor uh, portion of the reticular uh, formation there, Right, out to your muscles. All right, so a couple, uh, when we're discussing states of unconsciousness here, you might be familiar with some of these, if not all of them. Fainting, all right, is going to be just a short period or a brief loss of consciousness. Usually that happens when we've decreased blood flow to the cerebrum, all right, for a short period of time. For example, all right, MMA wrestle, wrestlers, MMA fighters do it all the time. They try to put somebody in what's called a chokehold, all right? Um, and I was a witness to this. Uh, I was at a, 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 well, I'll say it, a bar, and this a young lady who's very small, she was probably maybe five foot one, um, put a chokehold on my friend who is a three deg third degree black belt, and she says, I, you know, she basically dared him, said, listen, I can cause you to pass out. He said, there's no way that's going to happen. 
and she did it within seconds, all right, because she had compressed uh, uh, the, the carotid artery just enough to where it decreased the blood flow momentarily to the cerebrum that he literally passed out. It was, it was unbelievable. Um, he had just crumbled to the ground. He was about 250 pounds, and this girl was maybe 100, 110 pounds, and she dropped him like a stone. All right, so she basically caused him to faint. All right, the next level here, all right, is stupor. All right, so this is when you see in a movie someone gets punched in the head or whatever, and they're and they're knocked unconscious, and then somebody claps really loud or uh, or pinches them. You need some sort of stimuli, an extreme stimuli, all right, to really get this person to snap out of that state of stupor. There, all right. We'll see stupor brought on by certain metabolic disorders, um, diabetics quite often, right? You'll see anybody that has liver or kidney disease. Drug use is common, right? If they've taken too much of a certain drug or you've suffered some sort of brain trauma, all right? Coma, this is where you see in, uh, in movies or um, you'll see it in movies or in our... Um, Oh my goodness, or soap operas, all right? In that scenario, you'll find that somebody is going to be, all right, in a deep state of unconsciousness, and they're pretty much non-responsive, all right? Again, we'll see with severe head injury, all right? We'll also see it in folks that maybe have suffered from a stroke, or we've seen it in some of our, our, our um uh, folks that have undergone a diabetic coma, all right, if their blood sugar levels go very, very low, or an issue when they're dealing with certain drugs, okay? And then finally, we'll have uh, the persistent vegetative state, all right, and that is when somebody will uh, be pretty much, you've heard them referred to as a vegetable. Um, brain function is active enough to maintain all right, vital functioning, okay? But they do not have, all right, conscious thought or even awareness, okay? So every once in a while, you might see um, them twitch their fingers or, or shake their leg or whatnot, all right? And that will be just a brief uh, 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 muscle excitation. All right. Um, one other thing I want to talk well, there's a couple other things I just want to mention quickly. When we talk about the higher order mental functions, all right, I gave some examples, but when we talk about higher order mental functions, I'm talking about what you're doing right now, learning, all right, memory, reasoning, all right? So when you're going to school, when you're doing a lot of your functioning and processes in life, you are partaking in higher order mental functions, which really all right, involve, all right, the cerebral cortex here, all right, all those different regions that we were talking about, right, and in some cases, you might have to utilize, all right, several different areas of the brain, okay, so when we're dealing with, all right, motor function, all right, and you're learning certain maneuvers and, and, and skilled movements, you're going to be uh, using the frontal lobe, you're going to be using um, the brainstem, and you're going to be involving the cerebellum, okay? So a lot of these processes, all right, these higher order mental functions can utilize more than one area, and that's going to involve both conscious and unconscious processes, right? So and we discussed all that pri uh, previously here, all right? Then we have our sleep here, all right? When we're talking about um, sleep, obviously, very important that we get plenty of rest, all right, when we're dealing with sleep, all right, and the reason why is because, all right, this is where we are going to be undergoing, yes, we're going to continue with our vital functions, all right, heartbeat, uh, you know, uh, metabolic uh, uh, functions, you know, cells are going to keep doing what they do, all right, but when we discuss sleep, we're talking about a period where our alertness levels drop down to low levels, all right, and to the point where we have an absence of consciousness, all right, when we do not have, all right, a consciousness, all right, and our levels of alertness are very low, 
So we'll measure all right, the stages of sleep with a, a device that we, we call the EEG frequency. All right, it's an electronic encephalogram. Okay, and what it does is just monitors all right, certain brain waves, and those brain waves will tell us all right, the functions, what the brain is doing, and some of the levels of consciousness here. And we'll also monitor certain eye movements. All right. So when we discuss sleep, we break it down into two components, non-REM sleep and REM sleep. Okay. So the non-REM sleep, we spend most of our time, about 75% of our total sleep time is going to be in the non-REM sleep there. All right. And in this period of, of sleep here, this is when we're going to see a lot of actual uh, physiological growth, all right, because due to the release of growth hormone, all right, obviously during the rest portion, all right, we're not going to be exerting energy, but in fact, we're going to, if we have depleted any of our energy stores in the liver or in the um, uh, skeletal muscles, we are going to restore those energy levels. All right, and then obviously, since we are sleeping, we will be conserving our energy. All right, we really won't be using any energy except for the normal uh, vital uh, functions, all right, like heart rates, all right, operating the heart, operating certain tissues there. Okay, and then with the uh, REM sleep, that's the one that uh, is pretty popular where folks uh, we refer to that as the rapid eye movement portion. All right, this is when the brain is active. All right, and this is where, that part where you'll see the eyes kind of moving back and forth under the eyelids there, okay? So this is a, about a quarter of your total sleep time. This is where dreaming occurs, all right, that you can remember, okay? So it's always important when you ask folks, hey, do you remember your dreams? If they can, then you know they're getting enough REM sleep. If they can, it doesn't mean they're not getting enough, all right? Some people can just remember their dreams more, all right? But if you're getting a substantial amount of REM sleep, all right, you'll know, all right, because that when you have your, um, when you have your uh, dreams that you can remember, and if it's quite a few, then you know you're getting enough REM sleep here, all right? But at this portion of sleep, all right, REM sleep, this is where your brain is going to start moving certain components of memories, all right, from short term to long term, starts to kind of consolidate that. Um, for those of you that are a little bit older, you re might remember a function that they used to have on computers called disk defragmentation. And disk defragmentation is basically when your computer would take all this random information that was just scattered throughout the hard drive, and it would put it into these certain areas, these compact areas, in which it would kind of provide some order to it so it was easier for the computer to retrieve that information when need be. That's what your brain does, right? It's going to start to consolidate these memories so it's easier to retrieve them. All right, the term cognition is an, a really interesting term because it's a very broad term. It refers to several different mental processes, all right? Some of those are going to be awareness, knowledge, and memory, all right? And then all right, especially when we're dealing with perception and thinking, thinking especially, all right, is going to be a pretty advanced, but it's another higher order uh, mental function here, all right? But when we're dealing with cognition, we're really dealing with these association areas here, okay? And we talked about those association areas, you know, memories, all right? These association areas help the primary areas, all right, in, in trying to uh, give us as much of an experience as possible here, okay? And so, again, what really helped us figure out where these areas of cognition were, were, were found, um, believe it or not, is when uh, we actually had lesions in the brain. And basically, what, when, I, when I refer to a lesion, if you damage a certain area of the brain, and if somebody started to lose certain functions, then we knew, okay, if that area of the brain is injured, all right, then they start to lose certain functioning. So, for example, all right, the frontal lobe, all right, when we're dealing with the frontal lobe, we found, all right, the frontal lobe is where a lot of your personality traits were located and decision-making uh, functions and planning functions were located. Well, 
there was, if you've taken a psychology class, there was a gentleman known as Phineas Gage. This um, story comes from the 1800s. And long story short, Phineas Gage was a very kindly gentleman, very even tempered. Everybody in his town loved him, thought he was a great guy, got along well with everybody. Well, he worked on the railroad and he unfortunately had a railroad accident when they were trying to uh, build some railroads. And unfortunately, a spike had shot through, this huge spike shot through his skull. It entered just below his eye and then exited through the top of his skull. And this spike just went through the frontal lobe. And so what had happened was, after he lived, <laughs> he lived, but after this occurred, all right, his personality changed. Uh, he became a pretty irrational person, would have very, very violent swings in his uh, behavior, um, and he would just become very, very irrational, and um, he would make poor life choices. So that's where they were able to find out, okay, certain areas of the brain, all right, house certain functions, all right? So we can see that if you damage the primary sensory cortex, all right, then we'll lose, all right, certain body awareness, all right, sensations uh, on the opposite side. Okay, so we call that agnosia. That's the inability to recognize or understand the meaning of a stimulus here. All right, so for example, all right, you could see that if I were to damage your Broca's area, let's say, and that's in the frontal lobe, and that's the, the motor speech component, all right, of your frontal lobe. So if we were to damage that area, okay, then if mine was damaged, I wouldn't be able to speak very well. I, I would know what I would want to say in, in, in my um, brain, you know, but me trying to say it because that area is damaged, my motor, my ability to speak, all right, would be impaired. So, you know, I can read off the definition of agnosia and say inability to recognize or understand meaningful stimuli, okay? And so if I were to lesion that area, all right, I would say agnosia, the ability to drive a car, run up and down a street, and pick flowers. It would just be completely incoherent, okay? So the actual ability of me of trying to say that um, would be almost impossible. All right, which brings me to memory, okay? Memory, this is important, and I know that uh, uh, Dr. Seiler has talked about the seven bits uh, of memory and whatnot, and this is very similar to that, okay? So when we're talking about memory, right, we need to discuss the different types of memory. You have sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory, okay? So this picture here, all right, describes those different types of memory, sensory memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, okay? So let's discuss short-term or sensory memory, all right, that's basically, all right, some sort of stimulus is going to occur, and you're going to receive sensory input from that stimulus, all right, and that information, all right, is only going to last for a few seconds, okay? So how it's described here in our little slide here, you have a stimulus, let's say it's a sound stimulus, all right, you hear a crack, all right? And that sends that information to the desired uh, region of your brain, all right? And it's only for a brief period of time. If you're not paying attention to it, you're going to forget it, okay? If you are paying attention, all right, it's going to enter into your short-term memory. Now, short-term memory is going to last a little bit longer here, all right? When we talk about short-term memory, it could be seconds to hours, so it's, it's quite variable, all right? So short-term memory does have a limited capacity. And this is what uh, has been discussed with you before about the seven bits of information, okay? So usually that's why when you are trying to learn concepts and things like that, and you're trying to commit it into long-term memory, seven is the, is the number that you want to utilize, all right, at a time when you're trying to learn something. So again, in that situation, that information that enters into your short-term memory, if you again, you're not repeating it, you're not paying attention to it, you can forget it. But if you're constantly, like if you're looking at flashcards, for example, you're trying to learn 
uh, um, let's see, we're in chapter 13. So part regions of the brain. And if you're trying to learn the five, the four regions of the brain on flashcards, if you keep repeating it, you're going to encourage, you're making it less likely to forget, and you're making it more possible to undergo the process of encoding to get it into long-term memory, okay? So long-term memory, all right, is going to be the type of memory that could potentially last indefinitely, all right? So it might not be lost, okay? So to decrease the likelihood of it being lost, if you retrieve it from time to time, it like it's like that saying, if you don't use it, you lose it, all right? If you have to retrieve it from time to time, then you're gonna increase the chances of it remaining in your long-term memory indefinitely. But we have to go from short-term memory to long-term memory, and we have to undergo this process of encoding here, okay? So what's encoding, all right? Well, encoding involves these two structures, which I've talked discussed before, the amygdala and the hippocampus. Hippocampus is that structure I was telling you about. If you lesion that, you're going to lose the ability for long-term memory, okay? The amygdala will help with that. But this is where we're going to undergo that memory consolidation. Well, wait a minute. Consolidation sounds familiar. Yeah, that's right. That happens in your REM sleep, all right? But again, encoding is going to help to take the, those bits of information, all right, that you've learned, all right, and it's going to, as you keep undergoing repetition, all right, you're going to move that information and encode it into your long-term memory. Now, where can that go? All right, where is this long-term memory that you speak of, Dr. Kaz? All right, how do I find this? Well, long-term memory is going to be dependent on what type of memory you're talking about. If it's a muscle memory, like that juggling I was telling you about, well, that can be stored in the cerebellum, the prefrontal motor cortex, all right? Visual memory, all right? Re your ability to recognize faces. The more you see somebody, you'll be able to recognize them more. Well, that information will be stored, all right, in the association area in the occipital lobe. Right? Same with sound. Right? When you recognize a tune, that information will be stored in the association area of the temporal lobe. So that's what we're talking about here. We have to find, depending on whatever that stimulus is and that sensory information, it's going to go to what we call the appropriate association area. Okay? So motor memories are going to be in the premotor cortex and the cerebellum. Okay? Sound memories are gonna be in the temporal lobe, in the auditory association cortex, okay? So it really depends, all right, on what type of information we're talking about. So when it's time to go to retrieve that information, all right, you're gonna access it, all right, and as long as you've undergone that repetition, remember, the more you lose, use it, the less likely you are to, to, to lose it, all right? So there's always a possibility, you can see sensory memory, Short-term memory and long-term memory all have that possibility of you forgetting that information, okay? But you're less likely to, all right, if you go to retrieve it from time to time. All right. Um, that brings me up to amnesia, okay? This is going to be either complete or partial loss of memory, all right? And so it really depends on the extent of it, all right, how severe, all right, uh, uh, whatever that cause of that, mem uh, of that amnesia is, all right. So when we're talking about temporary, all right, we're only going to lose a portion of experiences, not all, but a portion, okay. So causes can be a psychological trauma, Folks that have been uh, veterans, for example, and then they've seen armed conflict, all right, there might be a scenario in which there was some sort of psychological trauma that occurred, PTSD, that they try to forget something. Or you can actually get uh, a brain injury, get hit in the head or something, right? Someone hits you in the head with a crowbar, right? You can have partial or complete loss of memory to that. So again, it depends on what part of the brain is damaged and how badly that part of the brain is damaged, okay? Again, 
If we deal with the hippocampus, all right, then you will lack that ability to form long-term memories from that point on, all right? All right, and then emotion again, um, just a quick review, is going to be involved with the limbic system, all right? How we interpret those emotions will uh, um, derive in the limbic system, but how we express those emotions are going to be determined by the prefrontal cortex there. Okay, so for example, when you're happy, what do you do? You smile more. If you're sad, you frown or cry, all right? That's going to involve the prefrontal cortex, all right? So I already discussed about what happens with the amygdaloid body and the hippocampus there, all right? What will happen if we lesion those areas, all right? Especially if it's the, the amygdala, you might experience some emotional deadening, all right? Or that your responses could be exaggerated. Um, depending on uh, what occurs, where it occurs, what's going on. Language here we discuss is mainly, all right, for the most part, going to be in the left cerebral hemisphere, all right, but when we're discussing the overall use of language, we're talking about reading, understanding the written and spoken word, being able to talk and even write things down. Okay, so when we talk about Wernicke's area, that's going to be more in the posterior portion of the cerebrum, and that's going to involve interpretation of language. All right, Broca's area is more in the front, all right, like the car motor is in the front, all right, that's going to involve, all right, how you are able to speak. All right, now the primary motor cortex will play some roles in that too, all right. But when we're dealing with a lesion to Broca's area, when you are trying to initi initiate the spoken word, you will have quite a bit of difficulty. All right, and finally, all right, when we talk about our language, again, we're gonna be dealing with the categorical hemisphere, all right, and that hemisphere will be active when you are analyzing speech, all right, and then the representational hemisphere, all right, will be active when you are analyzing the emotional content, all right? And that will be seen in folks that maybe are very inflexive in their speech, you know, and if they're um, getting, when you're speaking about something passionately, especially if you're maybe at a demonstration and you want to save the rainforest and you've been to the rainforest and you've seen, you know, the, the horrible, a deforestation there and it's really hit home all right these folks the representational hemisphere all right are going to be uh quite quite uh um animated if you lesion this area here all right these folks will have what we call apridogia all right and they'll and you might have some professors that talk like this they'll have this kind of dull emotionless speech they'll speak in a very monotone level and it really looks like they're an automaton and they don't have any enjoyment and they will have virtually no inflection in their voice. So that's what we'll see with apridosia. When we have apraxia of speech, we're dealing with the motor disorder. And this is pretty much what I was telling you about. All right. You lesion that Broca's area. All right. The person knows what they want to say, but they cannot say what they want to say. Okay. And then the aphasia is going to be a lesion of the Wernicke's area. These folks are going to have difficulty understanding or producing the speech. All right. So in their brains, it will sound normal to them. All right. But as they're speaking, it will be incomprehensible to folks hearing it. Okay. Not always the case, but a lot of times, when these folks are like, oh, I know what I want to say, and they start saying it, and it comes up all garbledy goop, and they have no idea, okay? And we'll see this in folks that have suffered a cerebral vascular accident, like a stroke, or again, if somebody just suffers a brain injury. All righty, that's the end of this information for this chapter. I know it was long. There was a lot of information there, but I wanted to get this out to you. Uh, I hope you found it enjoyable. And... Um, I will uh, see you in the next video, or you'll hear me in the next video. Folks, everybody have a great day and study.